All right, hello, and uh, thank you very much for coming to this session. Uh, my name is James Gortzman, uh, co-founder and former CEO of PlayFab. For those of you who didn't hear, PlayFab was bought by Microsoft about two months ago, so now part of the Microsoft gaming family, and so this is one of the sponsored sessions as part of Microsoft Talk. Super excited. Um, we have so much planned now that we're part of a much bigger family. And so today we're going to talk about live ops. We're going to talk about uh, PlayFab, the technologies we provide, and how ultimately we're dealing, helping you deliver that live ops strategy. But first, let's talk about sort of how the world of gaming has changed. So I, I got into gaming back in 2000, almost 20 years ago. And back then, if you look at the top 10 charts from 2000 to 2001, exactly one game stayed in the top 10 uh, one year later, and it was The Sims. And if you fast forward now to 2016, uh, exactly 70% of the games uh, stayed in the top 10 from year to year. So what, what changed? I mean, what, what was so different 2016 versus you know, 2000 that now you've got games in the top 10 for, for, for more than a year? And the answer, of course, is live ops. Right? These games are no longer packaged goods. These are games as services that are being built and then launched and then operated. And the operations phase, that ongoing day and day task of running the game post-launch is increasingly making all the difference. That's why those games are up there for, in some cases, games like Clash of Clans have been in the top 10 now for like three years. Because these are not, you know, if you think about the TV analogy, these aren't like TV shows, these are TV channels where you're continually updating and changing the content. And, and basically that's live ops. So a couple quotes here. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Space Ape. Space Ape, a UK company, has been really out there for a while now talking about live ops. They credit between, what is it, uh, uh, one and two thirds of their revenue to the activities they do as part of that live ops phase. Nexon has been doing, obviously, live games for really entire company's uh, history. Uh, again, the importance of, of live operations. Uh, this graph is actually from two different games, uh, both on our platform. So we grabbed the, the data showing uh, traffic. One of the graphs here, the red one, that's showing you the, uh, M, the, the, the daily active users over time uh, for a game that was not, frankly, doing very much of a live off strategy. They built the game, they launched it, they got an editor's choice promotion, so you see this huge surge of traffic, and then just over time, that traffic slowly came down, and eventually they, they, they pulled the plug. And that, you can see that, that was a game targeted kids, a casual game, so you can see big spikes on weekends, troughs on weekdays, versus the other game, the blue one, that's a game that took a very uh, uh, MVP approach. They launched the game without a lot of fanfare, but then they put a huge amount of effort into that ongoing day after day, week after week live ops, and just grew and grew and grew and grew the traffic and started to really take off, and it's continued to grow since then. So that's just showing kind of a snapshot of what happens with live ops versus without live ops. So what is live ops? Well, Anchor, there are as many definitions as there are Sorry, what is live ops? There's many definitions as there are studios. We as an industry, frankly, still haven't really figured this out. Um, we're out there sometimes waving the flag, saying, hey, this matters. But if you walk around GDC, the vast majority of the sessions here are still about how do you make your game, uh, the graphics, the, the physics, the art pipeline, the engineering of the game. You know, the actual you know, live ops piece, it's still a bit of a new thing. We sometimes it's called monetization. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of how do you manage your store, but it matters. So I define live ops as all the things you're doing to your game post-launch that are not actually changing the game itself, that are not actually going in and changing the game code. You know, obviously, updates matter, and, and often you have to do updates to enable live ops, but I'm really focusing on the things you can do from the back-end side to your game without having to actually go in and, and, and change the actual uh, game code itself. So obviously, doing this well uh, is difficult because... Um, you've got to be able to actually treat your game. Uh, you know, we, we used to treat our game as packaged goods. We would build them, we'd ship them, uh, and we were done, right? And if you think about what that meant, it meant uh, focusing on your publishing operations, focusing on retails, your channel, um, you know, all the work happened before launch. But now that we're in this era as game as a service, the focus has really shifted. We're focusing now on what it means to actually operate your game, where all that work is really happening post-launch. And so to doing this, is frankly really hard, very hard. It requires an enormous set of services all working together to actually provide that, that live ops. And the goal of PlayFab was to be a sort of one-stop shop, providing everything you would ever need on the back-end side to build and operate that game. A little bit of history of myself. I mentioned I've been making games for 20 years. Uh, my last role was over PopCap, where I set up PopCap's first ever free-to-play studio in China. And you know, in that role, we had to build all this infrastructure ourselves to operate our games in China and other parts of Asia. So I knew what it was like to build that stuff from scratch. And then back in 2011, PopCap got bought by EA. 
And everywhere I looked at EA, there were different teams also setting up games as services. And every one of those teams was building the same technology over and over again. They were building up their own data warehouses and their own live ops and their own servers. And we had some, frankly, back at EA, we had some interesting uh, fails. There's a game called Simpsons Tapped Out that launched, hit number one on the App Store, and the load of the traffic collapsed the servers. And they had to take it off the App Store, uh, rebuild everything for four months, and then relaunch it again. And so I remember thinking, wow, if a billion dollar company you know, has trouble launching a game and keeping up with the load, what hope do smaller studios have? Because you know, this is such a big investment you have to make. And so that's really the inspiration behind PlayFab. So four years ago, this is sort of what we set out to do. So let's talk about all the different pieces that, in my mind, go into a complete live ops solution. So the first one down at the bottom, these are game services. These are back-end server technologies that you need to provide into your game that I consider part of the core game design itself. Right? So looking at things like um, storing your player profile, or managing your leaderboards, or dealing with all your in-game commerce, or managing your social graph. Right? These, are like, these are game services that are part of a live ops solution, but really they're about building a, a modern game that, that your, your customers have, you know, expect, the features they expect. The second piece, the top right, hosting. If you're going to have these kinds of services, you've got to run it somewhere. And increasingly, it means running in the cloud uh, on one of the data centers. Uh, but you've also got to worry about how you scale your servers, if this crashes, knowing what the crash is, being able to analyze uh, all your log files, monitoring your traffic to make sure your game stays up. There's that hosting element. There's distribution, getting your game out to market, right? So that's if it's mobile, that's the various app stores. If it's PC, it's typically Steam. If it's a console game, you're working with you know, Sony or Nintendo or, or, or uh, uh, Microsoft to get it into those stores. Uh, worrying about the deployment, updates, there's a bunch of pieces around that, that distribution piece. There's the acquisition. How do you get players into your game? Sometimes that's paid acquisition, spending money on ads and ad campaigns and tracking attribution. Sometimes it's streaming or sometimes it's viral, you know, just making your game viral and, and relying on word of mouth. Um, and then monetization, making sure you're actually able to make money in your game. So that might be ads, it might be in-game uh, uh, payments, uh, you know, uh, microtransactions, it might be making sure the money you're getting is legit and, and not, not players cheating. And then finally, you've got the actual tools you need, all the, the live ops uh, uh, pieces to actually do the job of running your game. So this is what your, your live ops team would typically be sitting there using to run your game. So it's things like analytics and understanding what's happening in your game and managing and running your live events and, uh, and managing that acquisition process and running your offers. And, and you know, when you take all of this together, it's an enormous pile of stuff you've got to do. And if you try to build all this from either yourself or with a bunch of one-off SDKs, uh, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. And so the vision of PlayFab from the start was to be this sort of all-in-one uh, uh, platform. And that's really what we've basically built. And I'll you know, demo big parts of it to you today, but this can give you a history of why we, we set this company up. So this is what we have today. Here's how we think about our platform. A bunch of different pieces. We have a, a, a you know, player management, all the pieces around managing your player profiles and storing data for your players and segmenting them in interesting ways, uh, being able to message them and ban them and, and, and give your support team the tools they need to, to reach out to them. Tournaments to being able to um, handle multiplayer, handle leaderboards, prize tables, being able to uh, reward your players based on the, the events they're participating in, all the commerce, uh, the real-time analytics we'll get to. That's, in some ways, I think the most interesting piece because a modern game really does depend on how well you can react to, in real time, what's happening. And in some ways, the holy grail is starting to get to this state where as your players are playing the game, as you're learning who they are and what their behaviors are, starting to tune and tweak and adjust that game experience in real time based on them, getting down to what I call sort of the segment of one, where every player is really getting a unique experience. And that's the vision that we're certainly driving to uh, at PlayFab. Content management, automation, enterprise features. This is the entirety of the, of the PlayFab platform. So a couple things about us. Uh, you know, we were part of Microsoft now, but that does not mean that we're only focusing now on like Xbox and PC. We are still uh, entirely cross-platform, so we're targeting every major device. We're targeting every major engine. So we have SDKs today for Unreal, for Unity. We have an SDK for our newest SDK is for Phaser. We're seeing a lot of people now building HTML5 games uh, for Facebook Instant Games. For example, the Instant Games platform seems to really be taking off, and so we've got support for the Phaser engine. We also support all major clouds. So just because we're not part of Microsoft, uh, you know, we will be supporting Azure, we support AWS, uh, and Google. So we, we want to be really Switzerland, completely neutral, because we realize that our developers uh, are on all these different platforms, engines, tools. You don't want to be locked in. That's, that's really important to us. And finally, continue to support all the app stores. We actually had to go through some hoops to make sure we can keep supporting PlayStation, Nintendo, and so forth now that we're another part of Microsoft. So 
Um, just a little bit of history. We've been around for four, just over, what, four years now. Uh, we have about 80 million monthly active players uh, across about uh, 1,200, actually now 1,300 live games and about 3,000 developers total, including some pretty, pretty big name companies. So we've gotten some decent traction, um, but we have a long way to go and we're, we're, we're really excited now to be continuing to invest in the platform and, and, and keep growing the, the core service. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the actual building blocks of Lilops. What are the actual technologies that you, or the, the, sorry, the features you'll be doing to run a game? It starts with BI. BI, in my opinion, in the analytics, really is one of the most important pieces of, of your live ops strategy. Um, because ultimately, you know, knowing who your players are, everything hangs off that player. Knowing who your player is, what they're doing, really informs um, the bulk of that player's uh, journey and what you're able to do for that player. And it's way more than just vanity metrics in a dashboard. I mean, yes, we have dashboards. Yes, it's nice to know what your retention is and your monetization is and your DAO and MAO and ARPU and all these key KPIs. You need to know that. But if you just know these kind of vanity metrics, it doesn't actually help you make decisions of what to do next to actually make your game better. So for example, you've got a game and you're gathering data and events, which is good. They're flowing into your pipeline. You're getting things like um, how many players I had, how many logins I had. But then what? What if, you're, what if you're not getting the traffic you want? What if your numbers are lower than you expect? You know, take retention. One of our features is a retention report. You probably can't read that, but this game is showing uh, day one retention of about 30%. That's not great, right? Most games want to have at least 40% day one retention when they launch. Well, what do you do? You get this graph, now what? What am I actually going to do to fix it? And that's where we think it's so important to actually have the, 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 the mentality of the sort of lean model of having, you know, gathering the data, using it to form hypotheses about what's maybe going right or wrong in your game, having, you know, running experiments to test out your ideas, uh, measuring the impact, and then repeating the whole process. And so this lean sort of cycle is how we've seen the best games on our platform behave, and it's ultimately what we think is at the heart of a, of a live ops strategy. So here's an example. This is a, a, a graph showing how many players are at each level in your game and how many players have stopped playing at each level in your game. So in this hypothetical situation, you've got 14,000 players that are level 50 or above. You've got about 40, almost 50,000 players currently at level one, and you've got about 90,000 players who stopped playing after level one. So clearly, in this graph, you've got a major problem and something's happening at level one. A huge number of players are dropping out, right? So that's, that's bad. Well, the question is, what's going on? And what can you do about it? And if this is all you had, you might not be able to make great decisions. But what you can do is, as, is look at, what you want to be able to do here is look at all the players who are at level 50 or above. And then go back in time and say, OK, for a given player, take, take 100 players who got to level 50. Go all the way back in time and look at those same 50 players back when they were playing level 1. And then compare the players you know, at back, back when they were on level one to the players who, were, who dropped out after level one and start asking, how are these players different? How are the players who stuck around on level one different from the players who dropped out at level one? And start to, you know, is it because maybe, looking at your hypothesis, maybe they were earning more achievements. Maybe they were you know, more skillful. They completed the level earlier. You're looking for any, any signals in the data that are going to help you figure out what's different between the players you like, the ones you stick around, and the ones you don't like because of what they left and start to use that to say, well, what can I change to try to make more players who are dropping out stick around instead? And so, and, and, and when you're, once you've got these ideas, you want to be able to test them as cheaply as possible. So you don't want to say, well, the level's too hard. I'm going to invest weeks of time rebalancing the entire level, because that would be, frankly, very expensive and, and hard to do. Instead, the question is, what can I start to tune or tweak in the game quickly and easily to ask myself if this moves a needle. And so running A-B tests is one thing you want to be able to do. Um, you might decide, for example, if maybe it's a, it's a tutorial issue. Maybe you run a push campaign to send a message to all your players saying, hey, you died on level one. That's too bad. Here's some tips to get past it. Or maybe if they die, you want to give them a new item in your inventory. You're looking for simple, quick little things you can do to change behavior to see if it works and then be able to look back at the results and see, is that working? Is that, is that impacting my... my, my uh, my, my, my ultimate success. So that's a key piece of live ops is this ability to see what's going on, make changes quickly, run experiments, and ultimately craft that, that experience. So to do that, you have to have lots and lots of data, lots and lots of rich data. It's not enough to just have pretty graphs. You have to be able to go into a data warehouse and run queries and actually see what's really going on in the covers. 
So in PlayFab, we do this with a pretty robust data pipeline. We'll, we'll demo this later. But the idea is all the data from your game is being sent up to PlayFab. We're putting it through a data pipeline. We're giving you real-time visualization of it. Yes, we're powering pretty grass, and we're giving you uh, 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 the ability to search the data in Elasticsearch. We're also pumping it into a data warehouse. We use Snowflake, but there's a lot of other data warehouses out there. We can help you. You can put your data into any one of those warehouses through our, our data export features. And then you've got both the pretty graphs, you've got real-time searching, you've got the ability to run, run rules and actions off your data, and you've got the ability to get the raw data in a data warehouse that you can use with a Tableau or Power BI or some visualization tool. So that's, that's a complete data pipeline. And so this is some screenshots. This is an example of what the event search looks like, where you can go in and play with the data. We store up to 30 days by default in this kind of easy-to-use fashion. Um, we have a rules engine. We'll demo this later, where you can go in and create rules that will fire based on events meeting certain criteria. And this happens in real time. It happens with less than one second latency. So you can do things like, hey, in this case, I'm going to do an experiment. I want to reward players who get to level 20 with uh, gold. And so you can set up a condition where, in this case, uh, the condition is saying if, you, uh, if your stat changes and you've killed a the boss, then I'm going to you know, grant them a, a, a gift of some sort. Be able to segment your players, divide your players in different groups. Uh, based on you know, data from your game, and then treat those groups differently. Change behavior of the game, uh, maybe message players differently based on those, those segments. Tasks, to be able to go in and, and take those segments of players and to be able to actually then uh, uh, perform different actions for those, those player segments. These are all tools in your toolkit of what it takes to be able to, to, to take actions based on all that data you've got. And then finally, we talked about exporting all that data to a data warehouse so you can then go ahead and use it. So that's one major piece of a live ops strategy. And, we'll, and again, we'll, we'll demo this later. The, the second major piece is live events. And if I tell game developers, if they say, what's the one thing I should do in my game to start doing an effective live ops strategy, I say, do a, run a live event. Live events are the things that have the single biggest impact on your long-term retention, your player engagement, and your monetization. And there's lots of different kinds of events. You've got fun events, like maybe you're going to run a fishing competition as this weekend, where the players who catch the most fish in your game uh, get a prize. That's a fun event. It's going to boost engagement. Uh, maybe it's a monetization event. Maybe, you want to make, you know, maybe you're going to miss your numbers this month, and you have to boost your revenues, so you're going to have a sale promotion. You're going to say, OK, uh, spend more money uh, this weekend. And the more you spend, the more prizes you earn. And if you spend 100 bucks this weekend, you get this mega rare prize. Right? This is this sort of spending pyramids. Uh, maybe it's a marketing event. You have a new game launching that you want to cross-promote. So you're going to have a special cross-promotion event where play one game, earn an item that you can use in your other game, play that game, earn an item you can use in the first game. Right? That sort of cross-marketing event. Um, maybe you've launched a new dungeon, and you want to promote players to play your new dungeon, so you're going to uh, advertise this weekend only. Uh, we've, we've changed the loot drop rates in the new dungeon, so please go check out the new dungeon and try that out to kind of get buzz going for your new content. Um, my favorite are the tactical events, where you're actually using an event, almost like a scalpel, to make a very precision change to your game. Because a lot of times, if you're trying to, I'll give an example. Let's say you, you know in your game that players uh, who get past, let's say, level 50 are, are your best players. They're the ones who really stick around. And you know it takes about six weeks to get to level 50. And you have a pretty good sense of that. And let's say you've got this. And that's also where all your multiplayer action happens, so it's really important to get your players to that point. But let's say, for whatever reason, you had this cohort of players come in last week, and they just, they're not on that, that trend. They, they're not leveling up fast enough. For some reason, a huge percentage of those players who came in last weekend, they've just got stalled out around like level five or something, and they're just not progressing the way they should. And that's a problem, because they don't progress the way they should. You're going to have this sort of temporary bubble of players you know, six weeks from now who are not at the level they should be, and that's going to affect your liquidity of matchmaking. And your matchmaking will get screwed up, and they'll have a bad experience, and it's bad. So you want to get these players back on track to level up the way they should be leveling up to, to, to get where they want to go. So maybe you'll run an event targeted only at players at, let's say, level between levels like 5 and 10, which is that cohort you're worried about, where you're going to, let's say, make the castle, the level 10 castle upgrade uh, price a quarter of what it usually is. So all those players are, are going to basically be encouraged to upgrade their castles and get back on track and, and keep leveling. That's a very tactical event. You're making a very specific change. You can dress it up however you want, but the reason you're doing it is to basically fix a cohort problem you're going to have six weeks from now. That's a very tactical event. So this is an actual uh, calendar from uh, a company I worked with at one point showing all the different um, events they had scheduled and lined up. Because you don't necessarily want to have just one event running at a time. The most sophisticated games will often have a half dozen events running in parallel. 
And one thing we did at this company was we actually pre predicted what we thought the KPIs would be for each event, and then we measured the results to see if the results matched the expectations. And that's how we kind of got better and better at understanding what the effects of a given event were going to be. And that was a really key part. Um, one thing I love about events is the, the fiction, how you describe the event to your players, is often extremely different than the actual mechanics. So looking at this example, uh, I think these are from um, uh, Puzzle Dragon. Ultimate Dragon Rush is the event. The actual description is simply a new dungeon, a custom dungeon, um, that's available only after you clear Starlight Sanctuary Dungeon, and it's uh, very difficult, costs you 99 stamina. That's a mechanic, a new dungeon. But the description sounds, the skies are ominous, the earth trembles, behold, legendary dragons. You know, it's a, it's a very dramatic fiction. The actual event is, can be relatively simple. Uh, and then it's got a duration. It starts and stops at a certain time. So these are events. And starting and running events are a huge part of, of, of a great, you know, what you've got to do. Um, just some examples of our own, our own uh, uh, demo games we've done. I mean, for example, one of our, uh, if you stick around, by the way, at 2 o'clock today, Fluffy Fairy, uh, the creators of Idle Miner Tycoon, are giving a talk on how they've built, they're doing phenomenally well right now. Uh, they're built in Playfab, they're giving a talk on what they've done and how they ran uh, Fluffy Fairy, and they do a really good job at their events. In fact, they just ran a St. Patrick's Day event this past weekend, uh, which I think they're going to talk about, which it was a, was a big success. and, and um, uh, I should have put a screenshot of that in here. So anyway, and then the ability, of course, to, and, and to have a good event, though, you also have to be able to message your players to tell them what's coming up. You have to have in-game messages, uh, out-of-game push notifications, uh, message of the day, all the different channels you need to sort of tell your players, hey, you know, what's coming up in your game. Um, content updates, another part of LiveOps. So switching a little bit now, you know, another kind of, this is more the bread and butter of LiveOps strategy, is the ability to update and, and change your content over time. Add new items to your catalog, add new dungeons to your maps, add new playing, playable characters, all things you need to be able to have in your, in your system. Playfab has a number of tools for sort of managing that, that, that content for players, um, including, for example, the, the notion of having a store uh, as a subset of your catalog and be able to change different stores and offer different stores to different players at different times. Um, and then run these kind of offers and promotions and discounts in those stores as part of that, that monetization. Because again, managing your economy, managing your monetization, uh, another critical part of, of that live ops strategy. So here's I'm just showing an example of a store with a couple different bundles. And then here we're showing off the notion at the bottom there, we're going to demo this in a second, but the ability to go in and actually, over, and actually segment which stores are being offered to which players. So different player segments can actually be given different stores to start to change and experiment with that, that different behavior. And then we've got customer support. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you, you know, if you're running a live game, your customers will have issues. So you've got to have the ability to have your CS reps, whoever they are, be able to load a player profile, make changes to your player profile, do service recovery. So maybe someone got their account hacked and they lost their sword. They want their sword back. So you want your CS rep to be able to go in there and grant them uh, that sword to, 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 to recover that. You've got to have a permissions model to make sure that you've got different people in your live ops team playing different roles. You've got to make sure that those different uh, roles can't do things they shouldn't. So you might want your CS rep able to edit a player profile, but you don't want your CS rep able to stop and start your servers or um, you know, change the prices of items in the catalog. Um, and finally, you, if it, and if something does go wrong, you want to have an audit log so you can go in and actually see sort of what happened. Um, finally, uh, player acquisition, another major piece of this, where you want to be able to you know, run campaigns, figure out where your players are coming from. We integrate with a bunch of different acquisition channels like Kachava, which can help you with your attribution um, and others. So OK, that's all background. Let's get to the meat of this, which is really a demo of, of the Playfair product, which is sort of what I want to focus on. So what we're looking at here is our dashboard. And I'm just going to go back. We have right now, um, we're actually running right now in, um, in our booth, uh, there's a game we're running called Unicorn Dash. And Unicorn Dash is a multiplayer game that we're showing off. People are in there playing it right now, uh, and they're competing against each other to earn virtual currency and prizes. And um, what you're seeing over here, this is actually placement, this is actually a feed of live events being generated right now by players playing that game. And so you can sort of see as people are in there playing the game, events are happening. So for example, this guy, uh, Aki, has just, you know, viewed the, uh, the game screen, we should go in and see this person's profile. So obviously, the account was just created today. I think they're probably going to have one login for this player's profile. Yeah, one login. Um, they logged in with an email, so we've got an email address you know, stored as a, the primary contact for this particular um, uh, account. Uh, and as, as this player is playing, we can just go in and see, for example, the history of the particular player. Um, 
So you can see this person has been playing actually for a little bit of time. So you zoom in here, zoom in even further. Yeah, so you can start to see this is sort of the, the, the activity of what this player is doing in that game, you know, and this is all happening in real time. So this, this, this system is, is logging and showing you events with, you know, one or two second latencies. So you can see this player is kind of experienced. They've, they've actually been playing for a while. They, so the way this game works is you earn virtual currency as you play the game, and then we're letting you go and actually buy swag in our little booth uh, based on your virtual currency. So we can actually look at this person's um, VC balances. We can see this person's earned uh, 75 Unicoins, which is our main uh, currency. You can see they've actually purchased some things. They've bought a, a notebook, and they bought um, the race key is basically, uh, uh, we're using that as part of the, our, our in-game event system. And so we can actually go into our economy tab here. We can actually see what we're selling. So you can see, for example, that we're selling right now. These are the different items we're selling, a bottle opener, a cup, a keychain. You can imagine you could have thousands of items in your system. And then we've got an initiative of a store where in this case we've got these different stores. We have, for example, a main store where we have you know, the four different items for sale, notebook, bottle opener, cup, and keychain, uh, and the unicorn prices that we're actually selling these items at in the, in the system. But you also notice, if you saw in here, that we have a couple of different stores. We have a 25% off store, a 50% off store. And part of what we're doing actually is running events where each day at certain times we're switching the store to run discounts, and people can go in and buy items at a, at a lower price. Um, now, PlayFab does not today have a built-in event manager. It's actually on a roadmap, something we're, we're building for later this year. But one thing we do have is the ability to snap in custom tabs. And actually, this is a feature that we'll be launching right after GDC. The ability to basically create your own custom UI and snap it into our game manager. And in this case, we built for the purpose of GDC a little event manager where we can go in and actually kind of create events uh, and have sort of start and stop times. This is all in UTC time, so it's actually 4 p.m. today. Um, where we're actually switching different events uh, and actually running those at different times to, to schedule that. And so this is a, a kind of prototype of what we're going to be eventually putting into the product, is this notion of, of events and, and scheduling this kind of thing. Um, and we'd love to have you come by the booth, and if you're interested in learning how to build this and do these kinds of customs, come by our booth. We'd love to sit down with you and show you the, the, the specifics. Um, what I'm going to do now, though, is actually I'm going to go back and show you a different game. Um, I've actually got my phone here, and if you look over... Uh, let's see how it is. Let's bring up Unicorn Battle. So Unicorn Battle is a demo game we built um, to kind of really show off a lot of the real-time uh, segmentation and, and, and event features of, of PlayFab. So I'm going to go ahead and run the game on my phone. So I've just tapped the icon. I, I, don't, I only have one screen here. Let me show you one second. Let me quit that out and start it again. Okay. All right. So I just tapped the phone, the icon on my phone. The game, you, can, you can't really see. The game is now running on my phone. Um, and it just logged me in. So you can see there I am. I just popped up in the big screen there. James Gerson logged in. And you'll notice it actually has my face up there. Well, how does it have my face? Let's go and look at what's, what's going on here. So this is an example where we're showing off our, um, we're showing off our uh, uh, account linking feature, where you can actually, if you think about how you log in players to your game, uh, there's a dozen different authentication types you might want to support in your game. In this case, what happened is just by running the app, um, it grabbed my Android app ID, and it used that device ID to log me in and create my account. But then later in the game, I actually had the ability to link my Facebook profile. And that's, that's the best practice we recommend, because if, someone, if I lose my phone, I've lost all my progress. But if I've linked my Facebook profile, I can use that to log in on a different device and recover my entire account. And that notion of account linking and account recovery is a major piece of the sort of initial uh, authentication stream that you should have in your game. And so we support... Um, a whole bunch, I don't think this button shows everything, but we have a whole bunch of different, yeah, it doesn't. But we have a whole bunch of different uh, account types you can link through the APIs. Uh, Xbox Live, PlayStation, Steam ID, Facebook, tw uh, Twitch ID, uh, a whole bunch of others, and, and more always coming that you can, you can link in there. So that's the authentication piece. Um, let's go back to that dashboard. Another thing we've got going on here is, uh, let's go and look at, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, the notion of, 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 of rules engine. So let me show you what that rules engine can do. Let's go look at analytics. So in this case, um, you can see that there is an event in here called store view. Find store view event. Well, let's just go and look at actually the, the, the rule itself. So I've got a rule called reward store visit. So what's happening is the game is, if you think about the game, the game is continually firing events into the data pipeline describing what the player is doing. Now, the cool thing with PlayFab is a lot of these events we actually generate automatically for you. So a lot of these events here in this list 
are events that we're actually automatically generating just by using our features. So just by using our login API, we're going to generate a, a player logged in API uh, event. You know, just by using our purchasing APIs, we're going to fire off a player purchased item event. So you can see a lot of these events: consumed item, paid for purchase, joined lobby, left lobby, um, add open, add close, add rewarded. These are all events that we're generating automatically for you. But we also have a custom event feature where you and your in your game can add a new event anytime you want to with whatever custom JSON properties you want, just with a single line of code. You don't have to pre-register, you don't have to pre-create it. As soon as we see a new event from you, we know it's there and we'll, 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 we'll track it. And so in this case, the game is firing an event called store visit. Every time I visit a store in the game, I fire that event. And so this is a, a sort of silly little demo, but I've got, once those, those, those rules trigger, and you can of course have conditions. I could have had a condition like um, some custom field, you know, equal some, some value. Um, but in this case, uh, I'm going to do two actions. And we have a whole bunch of different actions you can fire. So you can have actions like you know, sending push notifications, emails, incrementing stats, granting items and currencies. Um, the most powerful, of course, is running clouds. So we actually run any arbitrary code that runs on the server uh, in response to one of these rules firing. In this case, I'm sending two little actions. I'm sending a push notification. And you notice a push notification can contain a, a, a template here. I can actually update and replace the person's name in that message. And I'm going to go ahead and grant the player five gems. So that action will fire when I, when I visit the, um, the, uh, uh, the store. So let's go ahead and let me um, bring up the dashboard here. And I'm going to go ahead and switch to my phone. This should work. Let's see. Yeah, OK, so here I am in the game. Um, let's go ahead and visit one of the stores. I just visit the store in the game. And you'll notice I just got a pop down, right? Push notification arrived with my name, Jimmy G, in it. And uh, I just got five gems in my inventory that I can now spend in this, in this store. So let's go ahead and see, sort of go back to the projector. And so you can see, sure enough, here's that event, store visit event. It came in on the, on, the, on the play stream. And this is the actual JSON object that was sold. That's a notion of what store was that I, that I visited. And, uh, and you can see my, my gems went from 68 to 73, so I got my five gems. Um, I've got a different rule which counted my store visits, and you can see the push notification went out notifying me what happened. So that's an example of a rule firing in response to an event happening in the game. Now, another thing that we're doing that's kind of cool, let's look at player segmentation for a second here. So let me actually go back to, um, so here's all my, my recently logged in players. Let's go ahead and look at like Jimmy G. So a couple things about this player. If you look at my, my, uh, my segments, You'll notice I'm in this segment called High XP Players. Well, let's see, what, what is that segment? So if you look at segments, I've got this thing called High XP Players. And uh, so what do we, so what, what can we segment? We can segment on a lot of different properties. And our segmentation system is based on real-time segmentation. I'll show you what that means in a second. But it's all properties that we can use to segment you in real time, as opposed to some sort of every 24 hours offline process that has to run, which is not great for changing game behavior in real time. In this case, um, I'm segmenting on things, I can segment on like wh which ad campaign you came in through, when you last logged in, where you're logging in from, what device you're on, uh, any statistic value in the game, how much money you've spent. Um, tag is interesting because tag can be any manual tag on the player you want, and those tags you can set offline. So if you want to do some super complicated machine learning AI thing that segments your players into groups using some sort of very fancy offline system, you can do that set tags, and then use the tags to change your in-game segmentation. But in this case, I've got a, a relatively simple one. These are all my, set, my, my statistics. And so to us, a statistic is any numerical property on a player profile. Um, in this case, if my total XP gain is greater than 3,000, I'm in this segment. And if I look at my player, go back to my, my Jimmy G player, look at my stats here. You see I've got a bunch of stats, and one of them here is my total XP gained. Uh, 3520, so I'm over 3,000. So no wonder I'm, I'm a high XP player. Let me reset that down to 2,900, save that off. And now that I've made that change, if I go back to my segments, you'll see I'm no longer a high XP player, right? So that, that, that segment change happened automatically as part of me making that change. And one thing I could have done as part of changing segments, I could have had, um, I could have had actions trigger on either entering or exiting segments. So I could have gone in here and said, all right, when they enter a segment, I want to make some change, or when they exit a segment, make some change. But in this case, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I just now, I'm, a, I'm no longer a high XP player. And the reason that matters, if I go and look at my economy again, these are all the items that I'm selling in this particular game. And our economy system is very rich. Our economy system supports not only all the items, as you saw earlier, but also the ability to create bundles. 
So a bundle is a basic a collection of anything that you get as part of a single purchase, including in this case gem bundles. So I've got these all these different bundles defined. Uh, so you can look at what one of these looks like. Like a Benga gem bundle is basically a bundle of currency. You could have I could have added other items to the bundle, other items, or or, or you can have bundles inside of bundles if I wanted to. Um, you can set a price for your bundle. You can set any arbitrary custom data on this item in your catalog that you want. Um, items can be durable or consumable. Um, bundles, by definition, are consumables. You open the bundle, it gets consumed, the contents go into your inventory, and the bundle's basically gone. But you also can um, you could have like potions that are consumable versus swords that are not. That's all up to you. We also have containers. Containers are interesting because a container, um, we'll actually look at this in, later. I've got this notion of a container where we're giving you items from a drop table. So we have these notion of drop tables that are basically probability tables of a bunch of items with different weights and probabilities. And we've got games out there. We have customers who have like thousands of drop tables, each with hundreds of items, uh, especially these, these collectible card games really go to town on, on drop tables and, and probabilities. So you've got your drop tables. And a container is like a bundle where the contents can come either by being explicit or by being um, based on drop table. The difference with the container is you have to actually open the container to get the contents out. A bundle goes right to your inventory. A container you have to actually open first. And to open it, you can, if you want to, set a lock item where you have to actually have the item in your inventory to open it, and then it gets consumed when you open the container. So basically, this is a locked crate, essentially, is what this is in the game. Um, why this matters is because you can go in your store, and the store then can be a subset of different items. And in this case, as I showed earlier, you can have a store, like this gem store, where the gem store is selling four bundles, small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, but we also have these overrides. And so a high XP player, in this case, is being given a different store. I've got it, I've got it set to give the gem store W, which is short for whale, the whale store. So basically, when the game says, give me gem store, if I'm in this segment, the system's going to say, actually, I'm going to give you a different store instead. And these rules all fire in order. You can actually you know, rearrange these to, to decide which one fires first. Um, oops, I just no, it's not cancel that. Um, but basically, you can, you can rearrange the order. And in this case, what's going to happen is when I go to ask for the gem store, the, the regular gem store, uh, it's actually going to give me the gem store WH instead. And gems with WH has medium, extra large, mega, and epic large bundles. So a much, you know, very different set of bundles. And this one, by the way, has a slightly different price point set. So you've got that notion of different, different stores. So let's go and look at that in, in practice. Let me go back now to dashboard. Let me go back to my game. OK, so if I go and visit that same store we were looking earlier, I'm no longer a high XP player. You'll notice I'm seeing small, medium, large, and extra large gem bundles. Right? The highest price point here is $9.99. So that's this original store. But now if I go ahead and play a battle and kill a boss, this is a very simple little game. I just killed a boss. Woohoo. Um, and if I go back and look at my dashboard, you'll notice um, over here a couple things happened. You'll notice that my player stats, XP, went from 2,900 to 3,520. So I am, in fact, now a high XP player. And if you go and look at the player profile, you'll see that, in fact, uh, I'm now back to being a high XP player. There it is, high XP player. Uh, and so now, if I go back, oops, hold on. If I go back now to um, my gun, and now I'll go back to that exact same store as I was looking at just earlier, I'm now seeing a whole different set of item bundles, right? I'm now seeing the, the, the mega, medium, extra large, mega, and epic gem bundles. So I've just changed behavior in real time based on a segment change, which is how you can start to craft and shape that player behavior based on, on what you're doing in your game. That's kind of cool. Um, let's see. Some of the things that we can do with PlayFab, um, we've talked about, uh, obviously, players and segments. Uh, our newest feature, very proud to announce it, probably the hottest feature people have been asking for, uh, is guilds. So we now have guilds. Um, and this game doesn't really show it, but Unicorn Battle, the other, Unicorn Dash does. When you first install Unicorn Dash, it asks you uh, what, um, what guild you want to join. You join a guild. Uh, and so you can actually see there's been three different guilds here. We've got Indie Legends, Assurance, and Play Fabricans. Uh, and um, you can see the other players currently in this member. And what's cool about what we've done with guilds is we didn't just build guilds as a one-off feature. We built guilds as groups of entities. And in our system now, any object is an entity. Players are entities, characters are entities, uh, even items in your catalog are entities. Uh, and what we've done is say, okay, you now have groups of entities, and all the things that go with a player can now go to an entity. So data storage, you can now have, so just like players can have data storage, you know, cloud, you know, can say files and JSON objects and properties, you can now store those for groups, including a guild. And just like you can have 
um, players can have inventory and virtual currencies, and so can groups now. You can have it. So essentially, we've added now, and, and we're about to roll out the notion of inventory and, and stats on guilds. This gets us guild leaderboards. It gets us guild trading, guild banking. Players can now trade items. They're guilding back and forth, all coming along with this, this, this guild feature. So, uh, and we also built in a system for um, guilds can have different roles. You can define arbitrary roles for your, your um, arbitrary roles for your, your groups. Um, so in this case, this one's very simple, just you know, two levels, member and admin, but you can have multiple levels of, of, um, of, of roles. You can then essentially create policy. We don't yet have a pretty UI for policy. It's kind of ugly UI uh, called JSON. Um, but basically what the policy lets you do is, is, is very specifically define what each role can do and what the groups can do. So you can actually, uh, without going too deep, this is very, very powerful. It can say, okay, you know, any admin in a group can set these properties of players who are members of the group. Um, any you know, admin can change behaviors of other members of the group. It's how you can define what your different roles can do for that group. Uh, and then we have a whole invitation system so players can apply to join a group um, uh, or, or you can invite a player to join a group. Um, once someone's applied, you know, you can define who's allowed to accept or not accept. Um, so for example, I think this is a, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so anyway, guilds, such groups, very powerful. Uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. Just literally launched last week. We've got tons of documentation up on it already, uh, including some tutorials on how to apply this in your game. But this is probably the biggest feature people were asking for, is this notion of how do I create these, these guilds and groups of players in my system. Um, we talked about leaderboards. One thing I haven't shown for leaderboards is this notion of a prize table. Actually, we didn't show leaderboards. Let me go back, and, and I, I showed statistics, um, but I didn't show leaderboards. So if I go look at, at my, um, my Intercrum Battle game here and look at leaderboards, remember that high XP player stat? Where every stat in our system is basically a leaderboard. And so I can actually look now and see all the different players ranked by, in this case, total XP gained. And this guy's obviously cheating. I don't know who ZF1 is, but let's just go ahead and zero out ZF1's stat and take them off the leaderboard. Um, and we're looking at things like machine learning and, and automated AIs to start to do sort of automated fraud detection. But you also can do, um, you can use CloudScript if you want to to actually write your own um, validation rules. Um, but by default, it's, it's set up so that you can, you can put on the leaderboard. Um, we have the notion of resetting leaderboards. Um, and you can reset them manually or you can, you can actually have them reset on an automated basis. So you know, depending on when you want to reset. And we also have this notion of, of, of when, you, when you set a stat, you can do different kinds of stats. You can basically sum, max, min, or last. And so whenever time you change a stat, you choose whether it gets added to the last version or, or max, min. So you can do some pretty interesting um, uh, math around your leaderboard without having to build a, a lot of custom logic for it. And then the reason the resetting matters is you can have credits called a prize table. And so a prize table is basically uh, a series of kind of ranks of your leaderboard. So for example, rank one to one versus you know, two to 11, or you know, if I wanted to, I could add a new rank, which is maybe, I don't know, 12 to, I don't know, 100 or something. And then this is basically like, you know, I don't know. Um, and then again, action. So what happens to all these players in this rank when their leaderboard resets? What do you want to do? What action do you want to take on those players? And in these cases, um, you can see for the number one, they're getting a message and they're getting five gems. These guys are getting just a message. You know, maybe we want to grant this person uh, a pretty lame item. Let's go into the, the catalog. Let's pick off of the system the, um, uh, an empty wallet uh, and uh, save that prize table up. And so now, you know, we've got that prize table. Um, I can then, you can actually then go in and set the prize table so when you reset the leaderboard, um, all the people who are at different stages get the prizes, right? That's part of, you know, a system you can use for your events and tournaments, which is cool. Um, talking about multiplayer briefly, so one of the things that we, we, we support at PlayFab is this notion of server hosting. So there's a lot of things you can do. So, so for any game of any complexity, you've got to have server logic. And you've got to have server logic in a place where you can change it and edit it easily at any time. Because you know, running your server logic is a major function of what you do uh, for changing your game. Because you can change your server logic much more easily than you can change your, your client logic, obviously. So a couple different ways of doing server logic. One way is scripting. And so there's something called CloudScript. And CloudScript at the moment is JavaScript that you can basically upload and version. And, we'll, and we, can, we support GitHub, so you can do it so that if you, every time you edit GitHub, we'll automatically sync to that and get your latest check-in. This little, this little GitHub button. Um, and, and what's cool about the CloudScript is it runs in the security context of the player. And so you know, if you look at the, the and, and, and we inject into the runtime environment our server API. So if you look, for example, I, did, I haven't actually talked about the, um, 
I've actually talked about the uh, uh, documentation for a second here. But one thing about PlayFab is we have multiple different, uh, um, we, have a, we have a really robust set of documentation, uh, and we have a bunch of different APIs. So we have a client API, which is the API that you're using when you build your game on your client. And you know, we have a whole bunch of APIs here, things like linking accounts and sending events and buying items and setting data, all these things in your client API. And every one of these, by the way, has a um, try it now feature if you're logged in. Try it now, where you can actually run the code and try it and, and test out the API from the doc site as opposed to having to you know, fire up Unity or Unreal and try it there. Um, so we've got a, a client API. But we also have a server API. Server API is a lot more powerful than client API. Server API can do anything. And server API is authenticated using a private key in your system. And one thing we think a lot about, and trust me, when you got acquired by Microsoft, they scrutinize the heck out of our system. We are, we've passed all sorts of security reviews. It's really, it's a pretty painful process. But we, we are, we have, we are, we're, we're secure. Um, and we can actually go in and um, we actually have things like private keys where you can actually go in and uh, um, you know, have secret keys that are used by the server to make changes to the game. And you can actually then revoke keys if you need to revoke them and, and add new secret keys anytime you want to. So that's, um, that's, uh, uh, that's how the server API gets, gets authenticated. Um, and the reason that matters is to go back to the cloud script now. Let's see, where are we? For the cloud script. Uh, let's see, where are we? Yeah, the cloud script. So in the cloud script, um, it's automatically authenticated for you. You don't have to worry about authenticating with the private keys. Um, and you can actually run server calls. Like, for example, um, let's see, uh, look at the top here. Um, scroll down to, here's an example, server.subtract user virtual currency. So here's an example we're actually granting or taking away from the player a certain unit of virtual currency. And that server is just in the API. And the current player ID is just another property that's set for you automatically is who the player is when the code runs. And the reason this is important is you can run the cloud script from the client. So your game client can call these cloud script functions anytime you want to. Or you can run this cloud script functions in response to those rules I showed you earlier. So going back to the, uh, the, the, the rule system, any one of these rules can fire uh, a cloud script function. Like for example, um, uh, if I want to go ahead and do run cloud script, these are all the cloud script functions in their current cloud script. We can just pick any one of those functions and, and call it. And when that function gets called, it automatically pushes in these parameters, not just a player profile, but also the entire event that triggered it, right? So this entire, this event has a whole bunch of JSON properties. That entire event gets passed into the function when it's called. So your function knows not only who the player is that's being called on, but like what the context is when that got triggered. That's super powerful. So depending on what you're doing, you can do a lot of really powerful things all with a kind of rules system, all within you know, sub-second latencies. Um, we also have a task system where you can go in and, for example, run a task on an entire segment of players. So in this case, you know, all my high XP players, and if I want to go ahead and, and increment, you know, give every one of those players 500 XP, uh, we can just go ahead and actually do it right now if we want. And so all my high XP players are going to get as magical little gifts of 500 XP. And if I look at my dashboard, I think we'll actually see that in real time. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe not, yep, okay. There's a bunch of players getting 500 XP. Um, and so you can see they all got, you know, so Bubba Bubba Brain just got 500 XP, great for him. So that's an example of, and I just got 500 XP. So that's an example of running a task uh, across all your players. And that's also how we can do push notification campaigns and messaging campaigns and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so that's one kind of multiplayer logic. But the other kind, of, we have a lot of players building turn-based games and, and, and idle games where their entire server logic was entirely in these scripts. And that's sufficient for a lot of games. But if you want to go more, more uh, um, sophisticated than that, or if you want especially real-time games, you can actually build your own dedicated game server um, you know, that runs as a Windows binary. And you can actually upload that to our system. And basically, uh, you know, so you basically upload a zip file to us with your, your executable. And then basically set up a bunch of modes for your game, like battle mode and, and warrior mode, and whatever your modes are. And then tell us you know, basically which, um, essentially which regions you want to spin it up in. And we support uh, all the major you know, data center regions around the world, Japan, North America, East, West, Central, South America, and so on. And tell us how many servers you want to spin up. And boom, we'll basically spin up servers for you uh, running your game server. And we have a whole ticketing system and a multiplayer system for your games to connect and get tickets and match and authenticate. Um, and, uh, and then we'll automatically maintain load. So we'll automatically spin up new servers for you based on load. And when player load comes down, we'll spin them down for you. So it's a pretty powerful feature. Um, and we do that, um, and we chart, we basically pass through the cost of the servers essentially at, 
at, at cost, a small, tiny kind of management markup. So a very powerful, way better way of managing building out a multiplayer game than doing it yourself. And of course, all those servers can use their server API to call in and do all the different things you need to do, the in-app purchasing, the receipt validation, player profile management, data storage, and, and so forth. Um, we talked briefly about content management. You know, we, we turned that in slides, the idea of having um, remote configuration is critical, being able to configure your game from the server anytime you want to change it. And so we have a whole bunch of different ways to configure data for your game. You know, um, this particular game had a basic kind of homebrew achievement system where that object lives there. Edit that anytime you want to. Now, you might not want your live ops team editing raw JSON. So now that we have our new custom UI plugin feature, you can build your own kind of data val validator and plug that in to, to hide the, the complexity of that data from your, your live ops team. Um, we also have some new features coming to make that easier to do. Um, we talked about file management, uploading any arbitrary files you want. We tie it into a CDN network so we can auto stream files down to your client and, and not make you worry about getting all that stuff wired up and working. Um, email templates, if you want to have a PC game and send emails, we can build templates and mail them out automatically as response to those, those rules. Um, we have ad management for doing rewarded ads, but I'm gonna basically, I've got 10 minutes left, I'm actually gonna take us as a good stopping point and um, open it, frankly, for questions, because I think there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I really encourage, I have, I have sort of two, two kind of calls to actions for you. Let me go back to my, my slides. Um, my first call to action for you. Okay, let's see. Yeah, my first call to action is try this stuff out. PlayFab is free. We are completely free up to 1,000 players. So you can have up to 1,000 player accounts and pay absolutely nothing, all the features unlocked. And then beyond the 1,000 players, you have a choice. We have a free tier, which is free forever, for as many players as you want, 10 million players, we don't care, limited features. You, can't, you can't use all the features for free forever. Or our professional tier, where you basically pay on a per monthly basis, a per mal basis, per monthly active player basis, uh, and all the features get unlocked at that. And we're happy to talk to you about that in our booth. But you can download it and play for free. We also have um, a book. And does anyone in the back to hold up the book? Yes. So we wrote this 100-page book called The PlayFab Definitive Guide to Live Ops. It is basically everything we know about how to run live ops in your game. Uh, and we wrote this, we're giving it on our booth, and we have a, about 100 copies in the back of the room. So uh, don't leave without this, this is super cool. Um, and, and we really tried hard not to be too hard on the marketing sell. So I think the like, PlayFab marketing spiel is like, limited to like, the last 10 pages. Most of this book is pure goodness about like, how to run live ops with tons and tons of examples from customers of ours and other games that we think are top of their game for live ops. So be sure to get your copy of this. Um, and finally, if you want your PlayFab swag, come to the booth, play the game, and then you can use the game, you can use the currency you earn playing the game to buy swag. We're giving out t-shirts, we're giving out tumblers, uh, all sorts of cool stuff. So with that, open it for questions, and I'll be around afterwards for more questions. And we have a booth with lots of engineers. Our entire engineering team is down here at the show. They're the ones manning the booth, not, not, we don't even have a marketing team. So come talk to our engineers. They, they'd love to talk to you about PlayFab. So thank you.